Well, we have been um, taking a look here at uh, this little class uh, entitled Witnessing Within Your Own Personality Style. And uh, just to review a little bit uh, from whence we have uh, come, uh, last time we talked about some misconceptions with regard to uh, evangelism, uh, one of them being that evangelism is an event. Um, no, evangelism really is a, is a process. Sometimes they're, they're events. In other words, you have a, have a one-time moment or a crusade or, or something like that. But typically, evangelism was really uh, much more of a process. We looked at the misconception that evangelism is a matter of selling. That puts such bondage uh, upon us if we, if we think that we have to close a sale and if we approach our witnessing with a sense that, okay, now it looks like it's coming to the close here instead of um, relaxing into that which God is doing in the life of that other person and how he is using us and leaving the results to him. We took a look at the misconception that everybody has to witness to a lot of people. Uh, extroverts are probably going to witness to more people. Introverts are probably going to witness to less people. Um, introverts uh, typically will carry deeper relationships. That's stereotypic. And it's a broad, a broad sweep of the brush there. But typically, um, introverts will have um, a few deeper relationships. Extroverts will have more and um, kind of more surface relationships. So, so. When you just look at probability, uh, extroverts will probably witness to more people. However, uh, the introvert will have uh, usually closer relationships with which to, to witness. We took a look at when Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses, that it's not just a command, it's also a description. It's who we are. We are constantly witnesses to his glory. We took a look at truths about evangelism, um, and that is uh, the truth that it is a team effort. It's a team effort. And so you're not the only, only one witnessing uh, to people. There are whole other groups of people that the Lord brings around, um, typically in situations, and you're a part of that team. We took a look at the importance to, of the need to hang out with non-Christians. Uh, um, an author has said, and I think, I think he's probably right, it takes about three years for a new Christian to totally um, change over the friend base. Um, to where the, the uh, new Christian then, um, all of a sudden in three years, all the friends are Christians because you get involved in the church, you get involved in the social sphere there, um, your friendships will, will change. Um, that's not a positive. Um, it's certainly a positive you're involved in the church and developing friendships in the church, but it's not a positive when you lose um, your non-Christian friends. <clears throat> and some of the most effective evangelists are the new Christians because most of their friends are non-Christians. And so it, it's important to intentionally do that, uh, those things which bring you into relationship with people who are non-Christians. And so uh, join a community group, join a neighborhood association, um, join a club, that type of thing, where you are intentionally immersing yourselves in the lives of, of people where you're going to run into non-Christian. Then the truth is of uh, evangelism, that God is the one that draws, God is the one that converts. We took a look at uh, how God uses us as salt and light, how God uses us to prepare the soil for the casting of the, the seed and also the casting of the seed itself. And we're all going to do that in different ways. Uh, introverts uh, will be different than extroverts in how we do it, but we're all part of a team. Lastly, we took a look at the distinction between form and function. Um, we all have the function of being witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The form will take different um, avenues. And so, for example, for an introvert, um, one of the forms that an introvert may feel more comfortable with is, is writing. Um, if, if we were to say today, um, say after church today, we want to canvas a neighborhood we're going to go knock on doors, and we're going to see if, if there's anyone there that we can share the gospel with. The introverts are probably going to say, um, sorry, I got something to do, right? The extroverts might say, yeah, I'm free, I'll do that, right? Um, if we would say, um, you know, this week, why don't you pick one person 
that you are in conversation with, drop them an email and just let them know that you're, you're praying for them and ask them, is there something that you can pray for them about? Um, ex extroverts might say, yeah, I can do that. Introverts go, now that's intriguing. Now that's intriguing. Right? So the introvert, um, using writing can be very, very uh, effective. We talked about how it's important for um, being uh, directional. In other words, uh, especially for the introvert, because the introvert has the tendency to, to ask themselves the question during a conversation, I wonder how the other person is perceiving me, and kind of, kind of sometimes evaluating um, the conversation. Uh, that can be a sign that, that you're an introvert. Um, so, so for an introvert, it's helpful to kind of, kind of focus on and say, no, I want to focus not on myself, I want to focus on the other person. So if you find yourself thinking a lot about yourself uh, in a conversation, try and, by God's grace, shift that focus to where you're, you're just focused on the other person. You're, you're just listening to them. You want to hear what, what they are saying. You're not evaluating the, the conversation. It's, it's not a performance. N nobody is going to um, stand up after the conversation and, and hold up card letters with numbers on it of how the, of how the conversation went. No, no, just kind of focusing on the... Um, on the other. Uh, we talked about uh, taking uh, prayer requests from people. Um, interestingly, oftentimes people who would say, there is no God, um, if you say, can I pray for you, they'll say, oh sure, you can pray for me. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and, and that can be just, just a, a nice non-threatening way of, of starting, starting that conversation, and deepening that relationship with, uh, with people. Well, today I want to focus with you on how did Jesus witness? How did Jesus witness? When we look at the Gospels, there are over 40 meetings between uh, Jesus and other people or, uh, or groups. In nine cases, Jesus initiated the conversation. So there's about 40 that we have recorded in the Gospel. In nine of them, Jesus is the initiator of the conversation. An example of that would be the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well in John 4. Um, there's an initiation uh, by Jesus. Well, let me give you another example. Let's go to John chapter 5, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John chapter 5. And we'll pick up in verse, verse 1. There we read, After this there was a festival of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew Bethsaida, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paradise, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm making my way, somebody else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. So here you have Jesus initiating the conversation with the person. 25 times of those 40, it's another person or party that initiates the conversation with Jesus. Uh, an example of that is over in, um, let's go to Matthew 19, please. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. So you have times there, 9 out of 40, where Jesus initiates a conversation with the person. 25 times, another person or party is starting the conversation with Jesus. So Matthew 19, picking up in verse 16. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, 
What good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I just love this response. The young man said to him, I kept all these. What do I still lack? Because uh, remember, what Jesus exposes, it's not just a matter of the actual action, it's also a matter of the heart. It's a matter of what we think. Um, verse 20, the man said to him, I've kept all these, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. You see, what Jesus has just exposed there is his God, right? It is a matter of idolatry. Um, so what he fears and loves the most was his possessions. Who's the one that initiates the conversation? But it's the other. It's the question that comes to Jesus. Or in Matthew 9, <clears throat> verse 9, You've got uh, a third party here. Matthew 9, verse 9. Or verse 10, please. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So here you have the conversation initiated by the other. Um, sometimes the conversation uh, occurs in the, in the workplace. Uh, let's go to Matthew 4, verse 21. Matthew 4, verse 21. So in nine cases, Jesus initiates the, the conversation. In 25 uh, times, it's initiated by uh, the other or a third party. Sometimes it occurred in the, in the workplace. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 21, as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they had left the boat and their, fa and their father and followed him. So initiated by others, initiated by Jesus, sometimes in the workplace, sometimes it happens in the home. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, Matthew, and then Mark, verse 29. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. <clears throat> as soon as they left the synagogue they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Or in Luke 19, verse 1. Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Luke 19, Verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead.